Hello, everyone. I'm Isabella. Thank you for joining the DFA Awards Design Dialogue hosted by Hong Kong Design Center. Every year, the DFA Awards organizes different events in Asia cities to enhance the society's overall awareness of creative thinking and design capabilities. Despite the challenges brought by the pandemic, we come up with a series of online dialogues this year. In inviting designers from worldwide to share their insights and design thinking with us. In the past few weeks, we had conducted the dialogues in Hong Kong, Korea, Japan, and mainland China. Here comes the fifth one today, and this time we have invited speakers from different regions. Before we start, let us share with you a video to review the DFA Awards 2020. provide a way to steer and navigate through the storm and better adapt ourselves to the new normal. Besides steer readable culture, derived from our theme is the topic of today. We are glad to have our past judges and winners of Design for Asia Awards and DFA Young, uh, Hong Kong Young Design Talent Award from different cultural backgrounds to share with us how they visualized the culture on their own journey. I shall introduce our guest shortly. Here is a gentle reminder. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the dialogue. You are welcome to leave questions to our guests by scanning the QR code on the screen anytime during the event. First of all, welcome our moderator, William. William, hi. William is the principal and design director of William Ho Wong and Associates. Strategy, uh, strategy Design in Malaysia, sorry. He is also DFA Awards past judge. And we have three groups of speakers today. First, welcome Bo. Hi, Bo. Uh, Bo is the executive design director and founding, founding partner of Contrapunk from Denmark. And the DFA Awards past judge. And also, he is the winner of the DFA Design for Asia Awards in the past two years. Next, we are honored to have Jay and Vivian with us. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jay and Vivian. They are co-founders of Subaki Studio from Malaysia. Their project, The Beginning, Step by Step, had won the DFA Design for Asia Awards in 2019. Lastly, we're able to have Thompson from Hong Kong, uh, he is the DFA Young Design Talent 2018 awardee. Recently, he has just completed his overseas undertaking in a design company in the Netherlands. 
the tonic. Without delay, let me pass the floor to William to kick start the dialogue with the topic. Besides Deer's readable culture, William, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Isabella. Um, I would like to thank you the uh, like to thank the Hong Kong Design Center for organizing this dialogue, you know, bringing together designers and people interested in design. I have been on the panel of judges for the awards on and off since 2006 and saw it grow from strength to strength. It was quite easy to win an award in those early days as the number of entries were much less. But now the bar has been raised very high. Having judged many awards uh, from D and AD in London to testing new cars from Tata Motors in India, I can say that the DFA Grand Award winners are truly the best of the best. We have been fortunate to be the recipient of the award ourselves. Besides design excellence, judges pay attention to each entry's contribution to humanity, solving social issues like community well-being, sustainability, and culture. We founded the Design Alliance Asia because it had some of the same principles as the DFA Awards, a sharing of knowledge and ideas to address Asia's challenges. Among the winners, we see designers tapping into vernacular design traditions, aesthetics and concepts to solve local problems. And my, back, back, and my background, 37 years of portfolio work, a long time, <laughs> ranging widely from branding to signage and to art and culture related projects. Southeast Asia with this incredible mythologies, stories, cultures and people deeply influenced me in my early years as a designer. And so with my camera, I traveled the region to try to make visual sense of these imaginations. This naturally led me to work on museums and in 2018, established Zakti Strategic Design with partners from different design disciplines. It's now all about collaboration and technology because design issues have become much more complex Technology has enabled us to track the migratory birds across the Arabian Peninsula. This will hopefully help the authorities minimize disruptions to the free movement of the birds. And we use tech to enhance the user journey experience. This is our exhibition in Dubai for the founding fathers of the United Arab Emirates. The redesign of the old Brunei Museum with six thematic galleries and were exposed for Expo Milan and a proposal for Expo Dubai, an interactive playground to raise awareness of water sustainability, particularly among the younger generation. And with that, I thank you. And I shall now pass the floor to our first speaker, Mr. Bo Dinerman. Thank you, William. And thank you, Isabella, for inviting me for this event. I'm really, uh, I'm really happy to be and contribute to this. Uh, I come from a completely different background from you guys in Asia. And um, I find this steering design steers readable culture as a really exciting theme for this day. And I take it quite literally because I'm actually a type designer. So readability is something I care about in everything I do. And I come back to this in a minute. Um, just to uh, say, what is my cultural background? Well, I'm a Danish and I come from Denmark, which is such a small nation on the other side of the world. And in Denmark, we are part of the uh, Scandinavian countries. I'll also come back to that in a minute. But just to say that I'm a designer, I'm trained as an architect, and I have founded Contrapunk back in uh, 19, 19, 1984, so it's almost 36 years ago. And in Contrapunk, we do actually branding, brand uh, identities, and we do that, as we say, to excite people and inspire change, because change is filling 
so much every day in our clients' uh, daily life. And we help our, uh, our clients to actually conduct changes in their organizations and to stand out as modern and fresh uh, companies in the world we, we are living in. We do projects all over the world, mostly in Europe and in Japan, where we also have our second office uh, in Tokyo. And um, as you can see, we, in everything we do, we base our work on type design. So type design is really something that we, uh, is core of our uh, competences and business. Also in, in wayfinding systems and like William just showed, we also do that here in, and what we say here is that we create unique fonts, uh, type fonts that secure recognition and tell unique stories. And I would like to go back and just to give you an idea about where I come from as an, as an architect and as a designer because I think we have a quite unique story in Denmark that I would like to share with you today. Um, actually, I'm educated. I graduated from the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen. And I actually think this is quite an important thing because our academy in Copenhagen is Academy of Fine Arts. And being an architect within a school of fine arts, we actually consider architecture as a fine art discipline. And I believe that that is the cause uh, that we can actually educate some really famous architects from this very small school, because we regard architecture not as a technical discipline, but a, as a fine art discipline. And that means that we actually create buildings in a completely different way than many other uh, do in the rest of the world. As you can see, the Sydney Opera, the Triumph Arc in Paris, uh, the newly caught uh, courtyard sc scraper in Manhattan are all made by Danes. And so we leave our landmarks around the world. And Coming back to type design, I think also being a type designer from this school, we actually regard the type design discipline a bit differently because we see type not as characters, but more like sculptures. And we actually form the letters like it was sculptures. And in this way, we get a more free you can say, approach to how to design a uh, type. Um, as I said, I'm, a dis I'm trained as an architect. Ending up, ending up like a type designer is quite unusual. But in Denmark, architects actually always have been working very broadly and very holistically with, um, with design because we can design both type, we can do ceramics, we can do furniture, we can do building design, jewelry, whatever. And this is an example from uh, more than 100 years ago from one man called Bindespil. And again, in a few years later, we had Arne Jacobsen, a very famous Danish architect, also working completely broad uh, across all disciplines. And what happens here is that suddenly last century, as any or other place in the world, the Bauhaus theory entered the Scandinavian uh, design. And this actually had an enormous impact on everything we did in, as designers in Scandinavia. And you can easily see here these two examples I just showed. There are only about 15 years between the two but these 15 years was the years of Bauhaus. And it's so easy to see how that influenced the whole way of thinking around design, not only in Denmark, but elsewhere in the world. But in Denmark, we had 
somehow a special approach to the Bauhaus because when Bauhaus has been uh, looked upon as a very geometrical, uh, you can say, influence, in Denmark we actually uh, interpreted that a bit differently with a more, you can say, organic approach to the simplicity uh, that came with the Bauhaus theories. And this is just an, a graph that I have, you know, that I often use to show the difference between the Southern European Bauhaus theories and the Scandinavian uh, approach, which is much more organically. And that also you can see uh, reflects on, on uh, the furniture design and how the organic shapes have influenced the way we design not only furniture, but also type design. So there's a very close relationship between type furniture architecture in Denmark. And coming back to type design, what we in Concepong always work with is to tell a story through the way we actually design type. And I have a few examples of how we can actually design a type for uh, the world's biggest producer of meat, of, uh, of pork meat, where we ought somehow tell the story about uh, the pick in the way the type has been formed. And, and likewise, um, if we uh, design a type for a museum, we can design the type uh, over the same shapes as the uh, architecture. So we get a close relation between the type and architecture. Um, another example is the um, Karimoku, the huge Japanese furniture manufacturer where we have also developed type faces for Karimoku that is taking its inspiration in the wood and the way the craft, uh, the furniture has been crafted around um, the Karimoko products. And the last example I would like to show you is for the restaurant Noma, which is placed here in Copenhagen and where I designed this typeface that also was inspired by the furniture in the restaurant and that actually folded out the new Nordic movement within, um, within um, uh, yeah, uh, cook, uh, what do you say, um, chefs and, and uh, making, making uh, dishes. So just to say that my background is very, very different from any of yours. And uh, with this, I would like to say thank you. And I hope you sort of had some ideas of why we are working with type as we do here in, in Denmark and in Concepcion. Thank you. A long story on a very short time. Thank you, Mr. Bo. Uh, well, I think you have shared many, many interesting insights for us uh, in Asia and many parts of the world. Um, you really designed to excite people and inspire change and change happens almost every day. Um, I was quite intrigued by your perception of type design as sculpture. That's a new insight for me and how Bauhaus has translated um, its, and changed its way when it went to your country. Uh, and there is a current discourse about Bauhaus and multiculturalism at this moment in time, which is interesting to follow. And now um, let's have our next speakers, Jay and Vivian from Malaysia. Thank you, William, and uh, DFA Awards for this invitation to speak. Uh, I'm Vivian. Hi, I'm Jay. Yeah, so I will be uh, taking uh, the uh, I will be taking the role of uh, presenting uh, these slides with you all, mm -hmm. and Jay will be uh, giving his thoughts in between, and will join us more in the Q and A session later. So, um, is the slide that's it? Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, I would like to share with you our background, how from how it all started in a very short 
uh, span of time to uh, how we've uh, to, to how what we do uh, at this point in time okay uh, we started our studio back in 2007 our background has always been in graphic design uh, to start off with and um, uh, we started very very young I was just a student back then um, we did a lot of commercial work uh, for the past 10 years or so um, and one day we started to get very bored with our commercial work we wanted some challenges and um, so hence we started to build create uh, more and more self-initiated projects one of it being the uh, type projects and today for the purpose of the sharing we want to focus on uh, the type project, uh, the latest one, which is also the third project uh, on type, uh, merely an exploration on uh, how far we can go with type design. Um, we've been asked uh, a lot, uh, many times before, why do we focus on Chinese types? Uh, what it's got to do with uh, our cultural background. Uh, in Malaysia, there are three main races, uh, namely Malay, Chinese and Indian also many other sub races uh, in Malaysia. So my background is in, uh, I've, you can call me Chinese, but I can't read or, uh, or, or write Chinese. However, I can understand it. Whereas for Jay, uh, his upbringing, he has been in, in Chinese school since young. And I was in uh, Malay school uh, since young. So we thought of exploring the Chinese type further, um, but with Jay being the lead in this project. Um, so in our team, we have that mix of people from different cultural backgrounds as well. We have always wanted to do projects uh, about Chinese display types. So we're thinking, why not take this opportunity to impart some self-initiated projects while not also doing commercial works. So far, we've done three projects and this is our third and latest. Uh, grateful that we have this all three type projects have been acknowledged by DFA awards. And this latest one was completed in 2019 after about half a year of uh, work with the research and design along the way. Um, this project has a personal uh, anecdote to it. This is actually a self-reflection back in 2018. You will actually notice that as I mentioned earlier, this project started in, uh, uh, in 2019. So one year ago, it happened all because of the uh, personal journey mm -hmm. of us two. Um, I was with a child back then, uh, just had a newborn together. And uh, we had a lot of drama in our lives back then. And so we found ourselves caught with lots of, um, I would say lots of, doubts, worries, uncertainties, and all that in our lives. And we wanted to see this uh, self-initiated type project as something that could help us uh, use those clutters that are happening in our life into something meaningful. We want our life to be uh, less cluttered in a way. So we, we use a, a format we think that could help us so we look at this project as something to help get our mind back into shape, literally speaking. And it actually helped us to put things back into perspective. Um, that here are some uh, slides or uh, up close on, uh, on the types uh, characters that we have done. Uh, we learned that there are thousands of Chinese characters in the world. Some say there are 3,000 characters, some will say 1,000 characters. So we didn't delve too deep into the subject of uh, Chinese characters, but we would rather want to focus on the characters that we know, and that's about 1,000 characters so far. So we focus on what we know, which is about that. Currently, these are the ones that are in our library for the purpose of poster application or other sort of medium. And here are the more of it. You, you can see that there is a similarity to each of these Chinese characters here. Um, it all started with the concept of sticks. We want to try to see how we can use 
um, long lines uh, that look like sticks to form characters, Chinese characters. Eventually, it turned out looking uh, like this on posters using different executions. And we had the opportunity to go further, not just on the type design itself, but exploration on the printing methods. And that's where we uh, get in touch with uh, a printer in Malaysia who helped us to uh, look at the type uh, design in a much different way by him offering us advice on what sort of ink to use, uh, on what sort of paper to use so that the type would be more appealing on, piece, on, on the paper. So you can see that coming back to the type design, you can see that uh, the type can be used rather differently, uh, whether it, you know, it can be matched with uh, images uh, or not. We had the uh, opportunity of working with one of our closest friends, close friends in Malaysia, Eric Chong. He is the guy on the far right with the very cool specs. Um, I have known him personally um, back in uh, probably 15 years ago when I was just a freelance writer for a bridal magazine. I interviewed him a lot, uh, but I didn't know who he was at the time. And then fast forward about 15 years later, um, we met again, but through him, uh, through Jay. And so that's when we felt like there is this connection going on. And as later on, we learned that he was uh, preparing for uh, Eric's 30th, Eric's 30th um, anniversary. And he also discovered this type uh, face that we were doing. We thought, why not you know, have this appear in his, uh, make, make it, and a collaboration together. And so here are the artworks that we have created for Eric's 30th anniversary celebration. Our typefaces appear in most of his uh, editorial shoots and commercial designs uh, for, for, for his uh, promos. So our philosophy, in fact, is uh, quite simple to, to follow. When, in whatever we do, we try to achieve simplicity and try to custom build things uh, in ways that we can uh, and also associate it with pop culture. It's, pop culture is something that both of us uh, also like a lot, which eventually led us to uh, doing a lot more of uh, projects. We got, uh, got, we got involved in a lot more of packaging designs uh, since last year. Ever since winning awards such as DFA awards, uh, we've been getting exposures. And also on our end, we learned a lot more than just exposures. It has pushed us further to uh, learn more about what's going on in the, in, outside in the world. And um, we noticed there is a consistency among uh, businesses or clients that uh, we've come across. They would want uh, localization elements in uh, their packaging designs or even in their branding or their outlook, uh, the image that they want to portray to the world. Hence, um, this particular project is what we love a lot uh, as well. It was, uh, it, this is a packaging for bird's nest. Uh, from Malaysia by an, a young entrepreneur who wanted the yeah, bird nest product to be, uh, to be appealing to the younger generation. So we discussed and we wanted it to modernize the whole look and image of bird's nest from traditional to something modern, which eventually then led us to uh, win an award for it. Uh, we are very grateful for that as well. So you can see from the beginning, we started off with type designs, uh, played a lot with lines and all that. We took that, uh, we took that method and uh, create further custom typefaces for our clients. And this Ignis is one of our first projects. And um, basically, the rest of the slides here also show our approach to localization. And our principles is to aim for clarity, 
we consider the functionality and identify the value of the, the business. And we hope that we have a studio to help clients better understand how we can help them in their business. And we look forward to more collaboration in, of that sort. So I thank you for the, uh, for the time and I will pass the floor back to William. Thank you, thank you. Vivian. Um, Malaysia and Singapore provides um, a lot of resources for designers uh, in terms of ideas, aesthetics, uh, from different cultures and civilizations. And I'm happy to report that the younger generation from both countries are really exploring identity, um, maybe also thinking about their own identity in a multicultural society, which can be quite confusing. Okay, thank you. And, um, and now let's have our last speaker, uh, Thompson from Hong Kong. Thompson. Hi. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for inviting me. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so let's start. Uh, I'm Thompson Chan. Uh, I'm a designer, independent designer, currently based in Hong Kong. And I, I love book, I love type like the other speakers do. And I, I was a lead designer in Morgan Chantel Design before in Hong Kong. And then in 2019, I spent a year in uh, Amsterdam in a fantastic studio, Tonic, as a senior designer and worked on some uh, cool project I'm going to show you later. Um, I started my career as a, a book designer. So I designed books and uh, it inspired me a lot of uh, typography approach of how we design things and how to integrate uh, a Chinese and English uh, language together. Because in, in Hong Kong, it is uh, somehow a unique context that we always have to do with it. Uh, and then eventually I went to a border field to design identities also in bilinguals. And throughout the years, uh, I've been uh, so lucky to be involved um, in some very culturally significant projects across Hong Kong and also uh, in Korea and in Netherlands even. So um, what, is, uh, what this project inspired me is that uh, how the design is actually reflecting the city culture and how as a designer uh, in Hong Kong working across geographically across the border uh, can be benefit from the cross-cultural dimensions. And the first project I want to talk about is a project that uh, uh, I was working uh, in Amsterdam with Studio Tonic. And then we were developing a, a identity for M Plus Museum, which is going to be opened uh, this year. And we maybe we are familiar with the M Plus Museum. The new museum in Hong Kong is going to be a uh, uh, focusing visual culture in ambitions to be a world-class museum in Hong Kong. So when I, as a Hong Kong designer, going aboard to a Europe, Amsterdam, great uh, studio, and then we work as a team from the European cultural context and looking back as a Hong Kong people to work on a Hong Kong project, I think this uh, cross-cultural exchange is give a lot of uh, flavor to to how we design and we add a lot of layers to it. So when we are thinking about how could we develop the brand based on logo already designed by North, uh, we have to look at it again, uh, what is Hong Kong? Uh, so when we think about Hong Kong, oh yeah, for sure, the, the crazy beautiful neon signs on the street, uh, the juxtapositions of uh, all the compact uh, buildings, high rise, and also maybe the, the city view always bustling. And it's not just how you see the city and it's also how actually the city is. As Hong Kong, we are very inclusive in culture. We have a lot of international uh, culture at the same little place. Like uh, you have different internationalities and you will see Chinese, English, any language in the street. They all come together as a mix. So as a, brand or as a museum that that could carry all this culture and as a rooted in Hong Kong, how we could represent these international cross cultural layers to it. So we are thinking, can we start with a, a sense of representing these 
image with colors. So can I have the slides, please? Uh, so we, we are looking for a set of colors that reminiscent uh, the image from what you have seen in the neon lights or the city view from Hong Kong that is very vibrant, but at the same time, just supposing with the high rise building that is more grayish, we find a, a range of mid-tone color, which is also carrying the same uh, gray values. So when these beautiful neon colors come together into black and white, they actually share the same gray value to a 50% gray, we call them mid-tone colors. And hence with that, uh, those colors could combine into some beautiful, beautiful uh, combinations. And it's kind of unexpected because how actually not vivid they are, but when they are combining together, it's forming a very interesting scene, which also reminds me how it looks like in Hong Kong. So from that perspective, we try to build the brand uh, with a closer application and this is how we try to use those colors and language as applications in the systems. And it's still developing, so I cannot show a lot. And of course, uh, it's fabulous work from Studio Tonic. Uh, I was lucky to be part of it. Uh, and then this project actually gave me a lot of perspective from how, as a designer, we benefit from uh, being uh, outside of the city, like I'm a Hong Kong people, when I'm designing a Hong Kong museum, but I'm taking European perspective, I think that's a very good exchange. And then the next project also with Geotonic, we were designing a museum for Onion, which is located in the Netherlands. And so again, as a Hong Konger, to have a new perspective towards this calm and beautiful city, also give me some a new perspective to with per new perspectives to the design. Uh, it's a calm city and it's a beautiful uh, museum. We try to rebrand, redesign the identity starting from a calm identity, but at the same time with my uh, new uh, perspective to the brand and also Tonic, we try to make the brand a bit more than just calm. We try to bring it to a radical approach where the identity could actually be transformed into a more uh, radical expression. And throughout this series of logos that the identity could be interchanged to show the idea of the museum could actually offer a new perspective to the audience. And from that simple idea, we blast it out to a visual system. So you will see uh, how not only the logo, but as a system, and the colors, how the typography and the graphics could come together and to represent the whole idea of a new perspective. And I think both of our party, the museums from Netherlands, Honik and I as a Hong Konger also benefit from the interchange of the cross-cultural uh, uh, exchange. And that's a, that's a beautiful result. And last but not least, I want to also show a project that I was working with uh, Mark and Chantal Design before. And it was a project that located in Korea. And it, we were trying to design a identity for a hotel in Korea. I cannot put on slide, sorry. So it's located in an area called Hongdae, which is a young neighborhood. Can I go to the next slide? All right, sorry. Sorry for the technical thing. So uh, it's located in a young neighborhood called Hongdae, but then it's an area where all the young people are doing art performance and it's a really young neighborhood. As a nice or luxury hotel, we don't want to be an alien, but instead we try to be a cultural activist in the neighborhood. So. It's not like we put a beautiful things just next to this VC or young neighborhood, but we try to build a brand, not like you expected as a normal hotel, just uh, exquisite or uh, very nice. But we try to build a brand identity 
we're very much inspired by the graffiti culture or the artsy culture in the neighborhood, which is more radical and to be uncompromised. So when we try to build the brand from the uh, logo, we take the Y shape and act as a, a graphic tool to just go on all the layers and information. So sometimes we don't care if the information or text was uh, covered or how it just supposed on top of some maybe important information, but it gives the attitude to the brand. And also we try to illustrate the idea of how we could be a part of the community to be part of the culture. Uh, this is an animation that you could show, you could see how the, the graphics could go over the thing. So it's not just about uh, the offline, and we also try to put this graphic language into the hotel interiors and the full experience that you could find the uniform, the, uh, the bathroom, the prints you will get in the hotel. And we try to even create a language for the brand, which is somehow uh, a unique uh, symbols for, for the brand. It's almost like a Korean language, but it's not. And we try to use our hands to print it, like uh, to, to paste it on the wall. So we went to Korea, to the hotel, to destroy the wall, like by hand with this bus stroke. And it comes from the offline, the visuals to the signage and to digital. So it's a full uh, brand experience that we try to illustrate. And throughout these three projects, I think it gives me a very strong belief that how we could benefit from being a, a foreigner, but working across the cities and how that culture could be mixed and to give some new ideas. Uh, so that's my sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Thompson. Um, Thank you. I think you had uh, quite a, an amazing experience because in my mind, the, suit, the two cities are extreme in the spectrum. <laughs> um, now we can have our panel discussion and Q&A session. Uh, viewers are welcome to scan the QR code on the screen and leave us with questions. Um, perhaps I will ask a question which um, all speakers can answer. I, I know, uh, Thompson, you already answered this, but you can elaborate if you, if you like. The question is, how does your cross-cultural experience inspire you as a communication designer and influence your design work? Um, should I answer this now? Yeah, you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think I just answered that uh, 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 just now, but uh, I, I, I don't want to elaborate that. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's exceptional. Like uh, ju I just said, uh, when I when I went about to, to join uh, Studio Tonic, uh, the studio in Amsterdam, to, to work back on a, on, a, on a project like M Plus that is actually in my hometown, my home city, it actually gives me a lot of new perspective, especially when we are trying to, to visualize what is the culture or how to find a clue to design the Hong Kong, uh, how, you, how we represent Hong Kong. So when maybe it would be a totally different approach uh, if I only stay in Hong Kong as a local local designer, but with Studio Tonic input and the experience about the whole experience in the foreign country give me a different perspective. And when I look back at the beautiful Hong Kong view, I, I could be a bit more sensitive and and to get advantage of that. And also in the Korean project, it's a good example of because I always feel like Korean could be a little bit more bold, a little bit more radical than as, as we do in Hong Kong. Uh, so that that impression also inspired me to go bolder when, when we're trying to, to design things. And that's why the officials that we tried is also quite radical that maybe it would not be happening in Hong Kong when I was working on that project. So the cross-cultural thing would be a very advantage and I would love to continue to enjoy that benefit from that, yeah. Uh, Bo, maybe I add another um, 
part to this question because uh, coming from our audience, there's one question which also related to the present question I'm asking. Um, you have an office in Japan and how does that work for you? Uh, and have you worked with Japanese typography? And basically, how, how has your cross-culture experience inspired you? This is an extremely um, wonderful question because, and I think actually this could take up a whole day's discussion <laughs> and, uh, and a theme because, you know, working as a type designer with type design, uh, I'm coming from a Latin culture in Europe, of course, where we use Latin type, but working in Japan and Hong Kong and Asia, um, it's, you know, when you work with branding for global companies, you have to give them a voice, a visual voice that can speak in any language. And that means that we can actually develop our Latin type to be matched with a Chinese or Japanese type script. And in that way, we can actually create a visual voice that can cross these different languages. And if you could give me, a, uh, if you could go back to one of my slides, I could show you an example of that we have done for Shiseido in Japan. Um, could you put that slide on? Uh, is that possible? Because then it's it's very clear how you can say how the the uh, Latin type has been influenced by the Japanese characters, as you can see here. So this is really also we, I can show another example, which is a typeface we did uh, recently for, for Vivo, the uh, mobile brand, where we also have, you can say, you have, we have merged, so, so to speak, the Latin and the Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. So again, you can speak in one, in one voice across the different languages, I think, this is really an inspiring approach because it also affects how we design our Latin typefaces and how we can adapt the Latin type to other, you can say, cultures, which I really think is something that will develop uh, as a discipline going forward from here. Um, thank you. Um, Jay and Vivian, uh, the same question. You are of course, living and breathing every day in a multicultural society. So mm -hmm. how, has that, how has that influenced your work and how can you uh, push it further in, in terms of uh, your own personal work? In my experience, uh, it is uh, because of I always travel to Taiwan as yeah. a lecturer and also uh, to, to Macau for my train as, as well. And uh, during these trips, uh, I mean, uh, it was so amazing because uh, during this uh, lecturing trip, not only uh, I can expose myself to these students, whereby I can share up more on uh, Malaysia culture, because uh, actually, uh, like Taiwan and Macau, the student and the designer, actually they are not much uh, so understanding about where Malaysia is. And also they are so curious about uh, the, the designers in Southeast Asia. So this is also one good thing uh, for me to explore more about Malaysian culture and also uh, a good experience for me to learn more about their experience and their culture as well. So uh, after, I mean, after every time uh, I got back from uh, these few countries like Macau, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, or Japan, and I will, I will uh, compile all my experience uh, during the time when I was in these countries, uh, which I visited to the studios and also uh, in the school, I will take all the, I mean, some, some photo I have taken and also some notes I have been made. I will, I will talk to my, my team and I say, uh, as a Malaysian designer, you should go and explore more on these things, like example, like design direction, concept, finishing, uh, the material that you use. You see, this is very common in their countries, but in Malaysia, you can you still can see uh, some lacking part like examples. Just make a, 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 an example like the, the the printer. If you ask them to do this kind of finishing, they say cannot. 
But uh, after I got this, uh, I, I call it as an evidence and some, 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 some proof, and I showed to this printer, and at first they will see it very difficult. But after I go and show them, I say, actually, uh, as a Malaysian supplier, you should go and try this type of technology or this kind of design. It's very, really, uh, actually, it's it workable for, for the design uh, society in, in Malaysia. So this, I mean, uh, for our studio, uh, for some of the good jobs uh, we have proposed to our client, we also are very thankful to uh, the trip. Uh, I, I mean, I have been made, uh, and I met with this designer and the, and the students. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, Vivian, please continue. Yes. Uh, I just need to add a little bit more. In my my case, is very much different since I am not the one to design things, but more using words to communicate with clients uh, on areas of design. To me, cross cultural experience, like William said, is a day to day thing. It's almost like just our life in Malaysia. And for me, it all started since I was young. Uh, I got my education in a national mixed uh, school. And uh, it has helped me to learn about tolerance, understanding and sensitivities towards different cultures and different and people of different racial backgrounds. So this experience, lifelong experience has helped me not just in my life, but also work basically all aspects uh, in, in how I operate as a human being. And um, communication-wise, it has been really helpful working with clients from different cultural backgrounds. Just in Malaysia, has helped, has been very helpful uh, in our business and dealing with as well. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question from the audience for Thompson. Um, are there any changes in your design style after overseas work experience? Oh, sorry again, I didn't catch it. Sorry. Um, a question from the audience. Are there any changes in your design style after overseas work experience? All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, uh, I can't say I did, that, I did not change, but I don't see we change style that way because the styles is actually how we visualize or how we interpret the design. Actually, it doesn't matter how the style is is how it was the, the what what you try to tell the audience or the users through your design. So actually, in different city, the design could be different because it's a reflection of the city culture, and and we are easily influenced by the uh, ambience of the city. So I would say easily when I'm in Amsterdam, maybe I'm doing something very like Amsterdam, and when I'm in Hong Kong, I could be also. Uh, influenced by that culture. So I think design is very, that's why it's very interesting how culture and uh, design could be uh, tightly uh, influenced each other. But still, I don't think style is that important at all. And and it's about what is right or what is wrong or yeah, what we try to tell. Yep, thank you. Um, just one more question here. Um, we are all adapting to this pandemic so with this year's theme of design styles, what roles do you think designers can play in contributing to the well-being of society? And really, what do you think is the future role of design post-pandemic? Perhaps Bo, you can start the conversation. Well, I think, um, again, this is a theme that we could also discuss for a, <laughs> a, for a whole day or more. But I see, you know, being a designer, we work with communication, of course, and we are the means of communication, so to speak. And being that, I think that at least that's what I try to focus at, is how we can actually communicate to the world how to, you know, make the world a better place. It's very, maybe a very naive approach, but I certainly believe and i also see that among our clients globally that companies are much more aware of the esg as we call it the uh, sustainability movement that we see all over and being a designer we are the ones that actually can uh, fold that out to the rest of the world and and in that way being you can say 
the the agents of change and uh, agents of movements in in the rest of the world. J. Vivian. Well, I think uh, yeah. as a role of designers uh, or being in this uh, industry uh, during this pandemic, I think we can provide guidance to clients uh, in their business, especially on areas such as packaging design. How can we still do good design in a very minimal budget, for example, because everyone's struggling financially and all that. So we have to think for the client uh, also, while at the same time, we have to be like, you know, sort of an educator to inform them of design trends on what's good and what's not, uh, especially on the sustainability side of the design. Normally clients, they tend to think that when they need to go for the, uh, the, the road to sustainability, it means that spending more money, which is not entirely the case. So we hope that you know, the role of a designer has to also um, be part of an educator. Uh, to, to assist clients, basically, in, in, in their projects. Thank you. Uh, Bo, you will have the last word, because like all good webinars, we are running out of time. <laughs> well, oh, sorry, uh, just, to, just uh, to say... Uh, uh, Tom, uh, sorry, I was... Uh, sorry, it's uh, Thompson. But Bo, you've got something to add. It will be very valuable for us. Okay, I just wanted to say that I really enjoy being part of this, you can say, uh, global, global discussion here uh, from all parts. I think it's really important that we do continue these uh, sessions with, you know, the cross-cultural movement that we experienced these, these years. And I think it's something that we should really focusing on coming um, in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thompson, you have the last word. My last word, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I was interested by your question just now. Like, uh, actually, I think now designer is no more like before as a secondary role. So we could be more upfront, like we are not uh, taking a job or providing a design service. But in this time, especially after the pandemic, I think as a designer, we could be more proactively do things, make design relevant to the society and, and to give message, to communicate with people with uh, positive energy. And that's what as a designer could do a lot more than just a secondary role. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, from the conversation, there seems to be certainly a lot of work cut out for us designers to think or rethink about our role in the current pandemic. And I'd like to be very optimistic, the post-pandemic, back to normal, back to the normal world. And as we design for clients, I think it's within our powers and influence to add wise clients of our joint responsibility for our society and our earth. And thank you everyone for sharing your ideas. And let me pass the floor back to Isabella. Hello, thank you very much, William, Bo, Jay, Vivian, and Thompson. We have gained a lot of inspiration from the sharing today. If you want to learn more from our past judges and winners, please join us again next week on uh, June 12th. Speakers from Taiwan will share the topic of design steers modernization on tradition in Mandarin. Lastly, we are now calling for entry for Design for Asia Awards and the DFA Hong Kong Young Design Talent Awards to, uh, to 2021. Please join and spread this news to your friends and family. Now let's watch the video to learn more about it.
missed the deadline of June 18 for DFAA and June 28 for Hong Kong YDTA. Now we come to an, the end of today's event. Thanks for watching and please leave your comments on the dialogue by scanning the QR code on the screen for our further improvement. We hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.